industry colleagues and welcome to another new episode of the Quest for Excellence series, season two, brought to you by Intellectus Consulting. As you all know by now, that the Quest for Excellence series is an endeavor by our organization to raise and maintain the highest standards of marketing excellence in our Indian pharmaceutical industry. Towards this endeavor, we have identified five themes or domains on which we aspire to build capabilities and drive excellence. Those five domains which I have outlined in the past as well are first, brand building excellence, second, marketing excellence, third, strategy excellence, fourth, commercial excellence, and fifth, leadership excellence. We have had the opportunity to interview several business leaders who have distinguished themselves in either one or many of these five identified domains. They have built very successful careers, and I would say even track records of having established outstanding brands, businesses, and even the whole ecosystem for their respective organizations. Today's episode is another new episode where I would have the opportunity to interview a business leader for India's top in, uh, multinational pharmaceutical company. My guest for today is Mr. Sandeep Reddy. Sandeep is the commercial director for Abbott India Limited. Sandeep comes in with a rich experience of over two decades, primarily spent in sales, as well as market access and commercial operations. Sandeep began his career in the legacy erstwhile HMR, as most of you would know, called Hex Marion Russell, which later transformed itself to call as Aventis, and then on to Sanofi Aventis, and today as it is called as Sanofi. Sandeep had a very successful track record and a career in sales management, where he was responsible for driving high visibility strategic projects for both the cardiology and the diabetes care businesses of Sanofi at that point of time. Sandeep had the fortune of building two of the biggest and the most respected brands in Sanofi uh, that, that the industry has known, namely Cardes and Lantis. We would hear today from Sandeep as to what are those key initiatives taken by him and not only in the sales leadership position, but also later on after moving to the head office that have built these two very big brands and successful brands to what they are today. After distinguishing himself in Sanofi for more than a decade, he joined, had a brief stint rather, with uh, you know, uh, Galdama and thereon moved to Abbott India Limited as the director for market access in the established products division. He was responsible for setting up the market access function, and it would be interesting to know his thoughts around the same. After a good successful stint in the market access function, he then became the business unit director for women's health franchise in Abbott India and performed exemplarily for more than three and a half years. Sandeep has recently taken over the country leadership team position of commercial director for Abbott India Limited. Friends, there's a lot to learn today on the rich journey and experiences that Sandeep has had over the last two decades. And I look forward to interacting with him in this particular episode. So um, I want to straight away dive into our conversation. And I, although we've never worked together uh, in way back in Sanofi, but I've obviously, you know, followed you and, you know, seen your career trajectory, which has been, you know, nothing short of uh, excellent in terms of how you built your career. So I see that uh, you had a considerable stint in the sales background, right? For almost about a decade with uh, the erstwhile HMR, Eventis, and then the Sanofi piece. And you were a distinguished sales guy building brands, especially in the cardiology and diabetes portfolio. 
So, uh, and, and I'm sure that you had the opportunity to build, you know, phenomenal brands like Cardis and Lantis. So my first question is, you know, how was your experience from the sales lens piece, you know, of having built some great high science concept selling brands in those days of the early 2000s to what it is today, obviously, but what was your experience, you know, executing those brand strategies, market shaping? I would love to hear from a successful guy like you. So that was my first question I had in mind to ask you, you know, and you just have to turn the clock back and tell us. You know. <laughs> yeah. You've actually taken me back in time, you know, when I was, <laughs> uh, you know, sort of reflecting back on what, what you know, what we did uh, back in back in time. Uh, some wonderful mem- memories flashed uh, across my mind, really. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll take Cardis uh, as the first example to talk about uh, you know what did we do then, uh, and and how did we shape the market? Uh, you know, so Cardis uh, came across um, as as yet another hypertensive to begin with. You know, uh, and and at that point in time, amlodipine was the you know uh, gold standard, uh, if you will, of of antihypertensives, and everybody else uh, sort of looked up to amlodipine as as the go-to drug uh, to lower the blood pressure. And in comes Cardis. And, uh, you know, one of the classical challenges that a marketer would have is how do I establish Cardis uh, when we already have a great drug? You know, when we looked at the side effect profile, hardly any side effects. Did it lower the blood pressure? Absolutely did. So how do we go about it? You know, so that was a classical challenge of establishing a new product uh, in a market which already had a great product that was doing exceptionally well. The doctors accepted it well. The patients accepted it beautifully. Uh, and, and therefore, the classic challenge was to find a you know, strong positioning statement for, for uh, Cardis. And I think um, it was one of those very early, um, you know, sort of uh, moves uh, of at least in Indian market. You know, of course, there were plenty of examples. I'm sure if you dig, dig a little, you know, uh, more in the past. But... At least in my experience, what I've learned is you got to have a, a, a real value proposition in order to establish a, a great, even if your product is great, you need to have a solid value proposition in order to establish your product. And I think what made, uh, what helped us establish this product against this, um, you know, almost giant uh, of a product in the form of amlodipine is Cardis was positioned as not just a great antihypertensive. Uh, but also a fantastic cardioprotective uh, drug. And that's where the journey really uh, started to unfold for us. You know, in the beginning, doctors started to, you know, push us back saying, hey, you know what, it's not a great blood pressure lowering agent. Uh, and therefore, why should we even, you know, prescribe Cardis to, to our blood pressure patients? But the way the company invested in, you know, uh, year after year, uh, bringing evidence to the to the fourth about how Cardis is such a brilliant cardioprotective agent, and how every one of your you know comorbid patient should actually get a Cardis, uh, it has been fascinating. And and as a, as a rep, I got truly excited because, you know, if I were to call out the critical success factors for uh, establishing Cardis as such a powerful brand that we all saw and witnessed, it, are a I think the fundamentals were great. Sanofi had outstanding fundamentals, uh, starting with segmentation, targeting, uh, great sales force excellence, uh, you know, metrics. Uh, but I think the critical success factors were great positioning of the brand uh, and great use of, of the field force in effectively communicating the evidence that Cardis had generated over that one decade. Uh, starting with the air trial to Erics to Hope and and so on and so forth. Even today, perhaps, you know, I can recall uh, some of the relative risk reduction uh, metrics of some of these trials, and such is the memory that that we all uh, carry of those those days. You know, I think it's very difficult to you know recall even one single secondary outcome or primary outcome of the studies that have gone through in the later years. But I think the critical success factors were great positioning of the brand but great usage of the field force to effectively communicate the evidence behind those trials uh, and and literally you know get the doctor to look at each clinical paper for its you know uh, objective methodology the primary outcome the secondary outcome and the probability of of chance or luck 
it was phenomenal. I think that I, those are the two critical success factors that established Cardis. And I think as a sales rep, I thoroughly enjoyed that process. And I think that's a huge, huge learning for for all of us as marketers. Uh, you know, when when you intend to introduce a product versus an established giant, how would you go about it? So we ended up not disrupting Amlodipine. But we ended up finding a great position for ourselves uh, as a great cardioprotective agent. Not so great antihypertensive, but eventually what happened is every prescription of a diabetes patient, every prescription of an antihypertensive or a hypertensive patient carried a cardiac. And it, there came a point where, um, you know, Nadim, back in the day, uh, our, our marketing head uh, said that, you know, time has now come to actually add a little bit of cardiac in our municipality water. Uh, because <laughs> everybody needs Cardis. You know, such was the conviction level uh, on, on the brand itself. And everybody believed, all of us truly believed in the power of the brand. And I think that's a great narrative, really. And, and as, as a sales rep, thoroughly, I have thoroughly enjoyed as a sales rep and first line manager of how do you really make use of our resources to be able to, you know, take, you know, we, we would compete uh, with the reps that would stand in the queue for the amount of time spent inside the doctor's chamber. You know, that was was such a great feeling. You know, as we walked out, there were 15 people waiting and we would have spent 15 minutes not talking about engagement plans, but talking about the papers that we would carry and we would mark them and we would show them. Uh, what a wonderful memory uh, that I recall of uh, of Cardis. So that uh, that is really fascinating, Shailesh. Amazing. I mean, uh, and that's true for uh, all brands that were built on the power of high science, isn't Absolutely. it? We Absolutely. worked for, our, for an organization that uh, believed in evidence-based uh, marketing, right? And I think that's what we taught the industry. Uh, and we engaged with our physicians in the platform of science. And Scardes was one classical example. And second, very beautiful point that you mentioned is leveraging the power of the sales force and building those real engagements with the customers, right? Not transactional, but really build on evidence and ability to shape the thinking of our physicians and HCPs on the merits of the molecule purely in terms of the end clinical endpoints, et cetera, which I think as you rightly uh, you know, elucidated went a long way. So I, yeah, I think it's very nice, uh, very nicely said, uh, Sandeep, brilliantly said. And then I guess you moved into the metabolic space with diabetes also getting added. And so I remember because I, I was blessed with the great opportunity to launch Lantus in 2003 and handled it for first three years. And then the team got expanded and it came in. And Lantus was already well on its way to becoming a you know a, a, the number one brand in the category, right? So, would you be able to share some of the work that you did in that space as well? That would be great for us. Yeah. So after you moved out, Shailesh, uh, you know, uh, Sushil came on board, um, and uh, you know, we've launched this uh, Lantus 2020 project, and I was the you know I was among the first lot of project managers that were picked, and it was quite innovative at, at that point in time to. Uh, pick medical marketing liaison people uh, who had the only responsibility of shaping this whole space. You know, I think the rest of the companies followed that, uh, you know, and, and I think there are plenty of examples after. But the very fact that we, we, you know, the organization picked some of those bright sparks from the from the grassroots and made them as the medical marketing liaison people just to drive therapy minus of sales pressure. We didn't have any sales targets. That was that was that was extremely innovative uh, back in the back in time, and I think that sort of made the real difference. That sort of pushed Lantus to the next level. Uh, that was one. Uh, but if I were to again call out three very specific critical success factors that have helped you know position Lantus as one of the best alternatives to you know the premixed insulins, which often give uh, episodes of hypoglycemia. Uh, uh, R3, uh, like I said, the, the first one is the India-specific pricing with the introduction of, you know, Solostar and the All-Star pens. That sort of changed the game because then the prescriber base sort of tripled, quadrupled and, you know, multi, you know jumped multifold. Uh, so that was a key intervention uh, beyond shaping therapy and, and beyond bringing in the whole project management concept. The second critical success factor, according to me, um, is is very sharp you know segmentation of customers uh and and effective targeting of customers and effective 
segment based messaging i think uh, lantus is one of those you know examples which which uh, really took the messaging to the next level uh, you know we never had one blanket messaging for all our customers but we broke our customers down based on their attitudes and their overall uh, you know personalities and accordingly tailor made our messaging and 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 worked with them very you know, closely and i think that made a huge difference and the third and that sort of helped us build a lot of prescribers we, because we never made one single message you know so that's the second critical success factor and the third one when i reflect back truly what made difference to lantus is uh, the pill plus service model uh, which again i think the whole sat sat model which was uh, which added which significantly enhanced the value proposition of what we were doing we were just not you know selling uh, a pill or a insulin but basically went back to the doctor saying hey you know what we will literally sort of carry your patients with us for the next one and a half years we will visit their homes uh, and and make a lot of difference to their quality of life and i think that is a real key uh, that served as a key differentiator and and that sort of helped us uh, break wall uh, the loss of exclusivity uh, when eventually a couple of others came in with uh, insulin glargine we i think we could effectively protect uh, our, our market share so i think those are the three critical success factors that i recall uh, of of a great brand uh, nothing wrong with the brand great brand in terms of efficacy in terms of safety but you know these are marketing pure play marketing interventions you know yeah. and i think those are those are some great lessons that i took away from uh, from my lantus time phenomenal uh, and i just want to spend a couple of additional minutes when you reflected it so brilliantly in terms of the success factors for both the products right segmentation based customized messaging which we had initiated and it went to the next level or even talking about the pill plus story etc these are strategic drivers of the business today yeah. uh, today you are at a position at a vantage position sandeep where you have brand marketers of the gen z you know reporting into your marketing heads etc i'm sure you would obviously drive and try and instill those same level of strategic marketing thought processes but what has been your independent assessment have these new generation of marketers able to adapt adopt the same philosophy of brand building or is it now changing as per the needs of the times what's your take on it just thought of asking you that um it's a very difficult question chali <laughs> <laughs> i reflected yeah. deeply on it no because you're uh, a successful sales guy a brilliant sales guy who's evolved you know and you've been there and done that right sandeep so i and you you've executed it now you're seeing from the others that's what i thought if if you thought no so uh, quite honestly the depth uh, perhaps somewhere is is uh, lacking and and should i just blame the gen z for it or should i blame the system or generally the industry for it uh, you know maybe it's a it's a it's a it's a fact you know it's a combination of all of these factors you know but what what i see is the lack of depth uh, there's a lot of width uh as a replacement to depth uh but you know and therefore there is there is this need to do x y z and more yeah. uh and therefore there is no sense of consistency for the customers and there is no sense of belongingness to a particular uh, you know communication campaign or a messaging uh, from a customer standpoint so i think that is something that i always strive to bring in uh, in my conversations with the young marketers saying uh, don't do too many you know just because you we need to be busy or you have a certain amount of you know promo budget to spend uh, you know build your narrative your narrative and your positioning has to be so strong that everything else that you do uh, should revolve around it uh, and you don't you don't need to you know copy paste what your colleague next door is doing or your competitors are doing you know so that is is has been my observation shailesh in the last uh, no you are absolutely spot on uh, sandeep and i couldn't agree with you more i'll be very uh, uh, you know for uh, saying this uh, uh, you know uh, head on because because when i interact with client teams it's i see that they want to dabble in many things you know the width versus the depth game 
and they want to uh, you know for the lack of the uh, depth what they do is they try to do too many things they get uh, carried away with the jazz of digital but with the core positioning the messaging understanding the needs of the customer is somewhere you did i think you're absolutely right and maybe i think the leadership also has to take accountability and say well we don't want to allow rightly said that so before i said the combination of several combination factors. absolutely no that awareness uh, at the leadership level and constant drive to to you know change or to bring in that change right. uh, is critical thanks a lot i mean that's thank you for being very and that's a very strong message for our marketers community who tunes into these uh, episodes right there are over a thousand plus so coming from you with a very humble sales background and now at the i think they will have to obviously look at this right i mean and that's thank you so much sandeep you moved into consumer care you know uh, after a very good uh, human health rx business so i wanted to pick your mind on it what prompted you to move and I, obviously it was the otx part of the business and sanofi consumer what prompted you to move there and you know what were your kind of learning did you have to i mean my question is did you have to unlearn something and relearn some new things or no it was although it was the otx but a farm human and rx based i added on to my skills i thought of asking you that question you know yeah very nice question chalish um so uh, you know first i'll tell you what prompts me to sort of take take these you know crazy uh, changes uh, and and since you said you have looked at my profile you know i've i've i kept moving and i kept taking up uh diverse uh, sort of uh challenges uh because i read somewhere i don't remember unfortunately i can't quote the author but uh, uh i think it was sheryl sandberg uh, who said this that careers are increasingly becoming uh jungle ladders they are no more vertical straightforward ladders and therefore you know it is extremely important uh, you know for any aspirant to keep learning uh and keep adding you know new skill sets new therapy areas new perspectives uh, in order to truly become a holistic leader as you grow up the ladder and therefore uh all that all those 8 or 10 years i did innovator evidence based medicine high science you know concept selling uh, all of that and, and and in came an opportunity for me to lead a large team of 500 odd people as a national sales head for this newly acquired company uh, of of uh, vms uh, vitamins mineral supplements and uh, back in the day quite honestly i didn't know what i was getting into i didn't know what i was signing up uh, for or what i was signing up for i just got into it because i just had this inner urge to you know do something that i didn't do before and uh, and and at the back of my head of course i knew i i need to do something else or something new which i which i haven't done before now coming back to the you know the 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 uh, position itself or the business itself i very quickly realized that vms is a very different ball game you know there is hardly any evidence there are hardly any claims uh the the they, they may work they may not work you're not even you know allowed to even say out loud that they work so it's a very different space to work with and um, and therefore it requires a very different you know you know different kind of marketing different kind of selling uh, and more importantly the emphasis is very very high on you know the share of voice and share of engagement and 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 and, uh, and if i were if i if i can use the word a little bit of you know channel push as well and 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 that's very different from what i've done uh, in my earlier stints and and quite honestly the organization needs to have that dna you know you you can't have a dna of a high science and research uh, concept selling and then also wanting to do this and i think uh, eventually sanofi realized uh, that it, it is not a great compatible business and eventually they had as you're aware now they they've kind of divested that business but i think the 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 fundamentals of the business are very very different and that's been my learning there that uh, you know you got to the you got to play the game by the rules of that game and if you can't play that that game by the rules of the game then it is best that you sort of at some point in time uh take an exit and and that's that's exactly what has happened with that business but uh, learnings have been immense so uh, uh overnight you scaled up on the leadership ladder from 50 or to 500 any leadership lessons in that journey 
that you all advise because a lot of business unit leaders, uh, you know, uh, uh, tune into our podcast. And so, what would be your kind of first classic? You took a classic, long time? classic, absolute classic. <laughs> uh, I was this blue-eyed sales boy uh, who kept growing after every two and a half years, uh, and therefore you 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 sort of certain, you know, as as you grow up the ladder, you sort of tend to assume a little bit of privilege, and you tend to sort of. Uh, you know, get carried away a little bit, and therefore tend to also pick up few things you consider as true lessons of life. But life again, sort of, is a great leveler, and sort of every now and then it sort of keeps leveling you back to who you are and what you what you should be doing. So one of the one of the things that I told myself as I kept growing in the high science space is uh, when it when it came to people, I always thought first who, then what. You know, uh, so I always placed bets on the 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 talent. You know, uh, and and we we had the liberty, we had the we had the privilege of choosing the best, and because we were working for the best products and the best therapies, and uh, we had the wherewithal. From there to a business where uh, I had 500 plus people, the immediate direct reports that I had were of my father's age. I was very young back in the day. Uh, and and then I had some 16 to 18 second line managers, uh, some 65 first line managers, and and some crazy 500 plus you know uh, TBM or, or, or territory managers uh, or front line executives. The learning changed from first who then what to deliver what's asked of you with what you've been given. So it's just it's just unbelievable, and and that learning stays with me even today from a point where I knew I, I could make choices to a point where you'll be given what you'll be given, but you need to deliver irrespective. That's, that's a massive, massive change. So I had to manage what I've been given, but deliver what's, what's been asked of me. Right. That is a massive learning for me. And I think that learning stays with me forever. And I, and I don't think the circumstances have dramatically changed in the next stint with Nestle Skin Health as a as a business unit head for India South Asia, there again the team was very different, you know. You, and and my realization has been that you may want the most idealistic things, whether it is in terms of people or resources in general to do your business, but there'll always be constraints. There'll always be constraints, and therefore, what could you deliver, or how could you deliver what's asked of you? with all these constraints is something that I've been sort of mastering over the, I haven't yet mastered it or conquered that space, but that's something that I've been constantly working on uh, over the last six or seven years as a PNL head now, because every single year, there are going to be constraints, there are going to be, you know, uh, downfalls, there are going to be pitfalls, there is going to be this, uh, you know, quarter that's going to be bad, there is going to be seasonality, there's always going to be uh, downsides. There is always going to be tasks. There is always going to be cuts in, uh, you know, budgets. But how do you still deliver? I think uh, that's been a classical learning in that period. I think uh, that's one. Second is the amount of resilience uh, in 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 tough times uh, with large teams. Uh, you know, I, I, I've had all all four classical hurdles: cognitive, motivation, resource, political, all hurdles. All the four classical hurdles that one can face in a business, but yet uh, I had to keep a calm head and keep going, keep moving uh, amidst all the expectations. Uh, and that I think is the biggest learning, you know, coming off of such a large team to be managed with all the four classical hurdles that I had called out. So those are the two specific takeaways from that stint as a as a brilliant, a brilliant, brilliant. I mean, you, you've articulated it absolutely spot on, Sandeep, and I think that's again a powerful message. I was tempted to ask you one of my favorite questions because it's been my life learning when I had a corporate career that somehow for a very strange reason, maybe serendipity, that my as a business director, you know, I perform very well in a resource constraint environment rather than having a surfeit of resources. Because then when you are having resource constraints, you're stretched cognitively to actually bring the bang for the buck and, you know, do the maximum allocation for things that projects that deserve it. What's your take? I mean, do you believe in that or or you say, no, there must be enough resources still to do it? No, Shalesh, there won't be enough resources. At least I have, you know, come to that, uh, you know, conclusion for sure is, 
is that you know increasingly uh, in any industry the, the focus is going to be on building efficiency efficiency uh, the focus is going to be building a leveraged pnl so sure. you know there will be few quarters of you know ample resources followed by multiply by the three number of quarters where you'll be working under constrained resources so i think the norm is constrained resources and we got to be therefore extremely efficient and innovative in order to deliver more with less so it is going to be a norm i have accepted it i drive that home every single day with my teams uh, to do more with less do more with less yeah absolutely okay uh, we move to a point now that with a very successful sales stint you and you know and also a bio head level stint with uh, you know um, um, nestle skin health which is galderma you decided to again kind of disrupt yourself in a way to move into something which was again blue ocean for you right i mean and this is very interesting and i you need a lot of risk taking appetite or maybe just for your career progression you move into aber epd right uh, and in a in a function market access function which is so much out there at a 30000 feet level with as far as the indian scenario is concerned so again um sandeep my first question what prompted you to move into such a role uh, you know from a very straight jacketed commercial operations sales marketing into something which is a line, staff role you know subjectivity role kind of thing so what prompted you to do that i mean i was very keen to ask you that question yeah you've been an industry veteran shalish uh, the access role at least in india is not looked at as a strategic role right um for a lot of reasons and i think uh, your subsequent question sort of uh, dovetails into it uh, but what really prompted me uh, 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 there are two very specific reasons uh, one of course clearly like i said i always wanted to do something that i haven't done before and this was something that i never never have done before and this even if and i knew that this this role had to be a relatively you know short term one one and a half two years kind of a stint uh, because i would have learned what needed to be learned in those one and a half two years so i was very clear that i'm going to do that stint for about a couple of years but also i wanted to work with a large organization which has enough headroom for me to then be able to maneuver around and and make my career uh, you know within within a large organization so i think those are two very specific reasons uh, which prompted me to you know take a yeah. punt and eventually land here yeah and um, uh, would it be fair to say that when we look at the market access lens in india which is a subsequent question i want it's more seen very tactically as a function of accessibility affordability and just availability right all the three a's versus really talking about how it's in the developing markets or emerging markets of value or reference pricing models payer model and building out those synergistic stuff so uh, do you think that will mature in india sandi what's just your top level thinking or do you think that access as a function will mature in india or you think it is just going to be this public market in our kind of availability which generally i mean i just thought of picking your brains there so I, i after having worked in that space and after having really uh, spent good 24 months in that space uh, you know i can tell you that uh, this is my personal experience is, is yes. that uh, firstly india is not is is largely a 95% out of pocket uh, expenditure market you know we are not uh, covered by any form of insurance by, by the government so and and i don't see that changing and as long as that doesn't change there is going to be a very little buying uh, and and that buying will be at a very very low price and therefore that market is largely going to be competed by the manufacturers themselves uh, not necessarily great marketing companies and and therefore that just takes away the interest uh for all the multinationals who bring in research products and and the true access happens uh in markets where there is the government's intervention to protect their uh, citizens and therefore i at least for the next two or three decades don't see that changing uh in india right that's what thank you lot thanks a lot for putting you know putting out your uh, neck out there because that's personal opinion on my platform and that's absolutely fine so view point i forgot uh, you know i i had one question in mind which i thought i will definitely ask you is you've had a rich stint of almost 4 years and the first uh, pnl role as the head of the women's health business in abbott itself and i wanted to ask you 
it it was it a kind of is is your business of women's health a branded generics play uh, with uh, or is it uh, licensed products because your learnings would be phenomenally different when you are competing in a branded generics space in women's health fertility against the innovators and other low priced uh, yes. how has it been uh, in abert and and that to in a branded generic space what was your from innovator products to the the whole spectrum right i just thought of asking you how was it how was the journey so luckily i think um, you know women's health we do have innovator products uh, a okay. large majority of them are innovator products of course f- you know uh, you know competing with branded generics in the branded generic space so therefore uh, all of my learnings from sanofi are are put to good use so Uh, not much of a difference really uh, this is not like the truly branded uh, generic space there are innovative products that we have and of course uh, you know we we like i said we compete in that uh, brand generic space excellent excellent um differentiation of brands is so critical along with the first points that you mentioned on positioning segmentation which are all very important strategic tools that help drive differentiation value proposition building and i'm it's heartening for us to see that when leaders at that level like you say that unfortunately as you said you know when we discussed at a short while it's gone missing and it's got replaced by everything else other than this now with so much of competitive play do you don't you do you feel that it's got to come back to the discussion table and whether you're building portfolios of innovators or you know branded generic you, st- you can still there is enough headroom for creating meaningful value for physicians and patients what's your take on that absolutely yes absolutely yes and you know in in all our discussions around new product introductions or, or the existing uh, uh, portfolios though you know one thing that we always keep pressing for is uh, what's the value proposition how are we different uh how are we adding value to the patient or to the doctor and and uh, we keep reinventing all the time you know uh whether it could be around packaging whether it could be around expansion of new indication uh you know or bringing forth new evidence uh or just bringing out heor data or real world evidence there are several ways of doing it as long as you ask you keep asking that one question as to how you taking that one notch up you know for existing products of course for the new products clearly you know what's the right to win you know just can't imagine that uh, you're going to win all you know uh, uh, just because you've launched a product or you're just going to you know make some calls to the doctors so very clearly that that and that alone is 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 critical what's your what's your value add what's how are you different you right. know so very yeah. clear Right, and a corollary to that is another question, uh, Sandeep. Is many people feel today that pharma marketing is under siege. There's been a lot of uh, emphasis or thrust on the short term and outcomes based, rather than strategically thinking of building businesses for the long, medium to long term. You know, so uh, so obviously the practices of brand building and marketing seems to be under pressure. Technically, the pressure to deliver has been so much, and the irony is that you can't deliver unless you build a fundamental so it's obvious that you got to juggle with both these both what's your uh, take on this and what's your message you know do we only focus on short term or you got to obviously build the long term as well right but then people say if you don't build the short term there is no long term or why so what's your general take as a lead director who's sitting on the you know as a vantage point in, in terms of handling the, what's your take on it i just thought of asking you that question you no know, for sure uh, you know when we launch a product uh, or when we take a product to the market uh, you know one must have on and we you know we always do make sure that we have a you know full five year long planning uh, however you know of course it is important to you know achieve the results i can't just say that you know it's it's okay to you know fail in the first two three quarters and then we'll make up uh, then the next uh, couple of quarters there is always going to be in in a competitive world uh, like like ours there is going to be uh, a focus on on both the short term and the long term uh, and and that's where i think planning helps you know uh, you know planning almost 6 to 9 months in advance uh, is super helpful and i don't think we do that as much and as frequently for all our products at least you know not so much in a lot of companies but <clears throat> the trick is to 
really plan in advance to firstly yeah. work out your right to win your model your go to market model uh your positioning like i said uh and in the end if 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 there is going to be a lot of generic play then what else could you do in order to truly differentiate your product and if you have figured out all of these four boxes yeah uh perhaps your short term and long term are going to be protected yes. but if you pick only three out of four you will obviously uh, you know uh, be a little shaky so i think that's uh, uh, what is going to be the key that's what has always remained the key the, the planning <clears throat> in advance that So being a student of pharma marketing and especially the strategic stuff you know one of the key drivers for not just innovative brands but also you know good position products which are in the competitive space is life cycle management product life cycle management building out indications they you know do you think enough thought is nowadays given to life cycle management of brands or you find that we could do much better because i thought of asking because everybody keeps launching new products but that's not enough what about managing the current life cycle of brand because the marketers of today's generation they keep wanting to ask for new products but what about existing product life cycle such a powerful strategy especially in the global context life cycle management strategy is is a completely different box in itself right so just thought of asking you because you work for india's number one pharma company so i thought of just asking you that question as well yeah i think there are few who do it and who do it diligently who do it exceptionally well and those then those products become great brands uh, that the industry knows them for uh but in general i don't see that happening all that frequently and and i think if enough thought is put behind growing a brand uh, then naturally you start inventing necessity is the mother of invention right. so you know so the race is after building portfolio and revenue not necessarily a brand uh, but you know i really like the philosophy of fewer bigger bolder yeah. and and therefore if you if you've made your choices then you stay invested and you keep reinventing uh indications line extensions in terms of products uh, combinations whatever else could could be done uh but to answer your question straight i think uh, more could be done more could be done. thanks thanks for that uh, position moving to the last part of our interaction because i want to respect your time and we have about 15 minutes to go um we have always said that brand marketers in our industry obviously need to have the competencies around you know functional behavioral and etc and brand building the new age marketing today i was you know especially digital skills or data analytics skills also plays an extremely important role qualitative quantitative etc and again uh, sandeep i find that marketers are a little found wanting in terms of the quantitative aspects and it, how has been your personal observation or uh, do you believe that the new and including storytelling not just your know, ability to convey i know i smile but these are new age skills right i just thought of asking you again a question out of the box what's your personal do you look for these do you tell you push your teams and say yes guys you got to build this out as well and for for our business so i just thought of asking that yeah. absolutely so you know almost all large organizations established organizations have a structured brand planning process you know so uh, i don't think that you know is is a problem and therefore you know when a young marketer comes in yeah. you know i always give them three or four you know formulae to 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 be absolutely on the top of their game the first is ability to gather insights you know uh, from the market Uh, and put them into action by means of experimenting okay so that is something that i strongly advise you know you just insights can come from several ways data is one thing that can naturally happen to you because you're a, you're you're a, you know you're somebody who's used to it assets all that is fine but the real insights sometimes uh, you know not sometimes a lot of times come from you know from the customers uh from the channel partners from your own employees and therefore i think that insight mining is mm. is extremely extremely important uh, and once having gathered your insights you got to go out and experiment take that risk tell us how how much is it going to cost and as long as the you know experiment is not as risky to the brand's overall position or overall equity uh you know we would be far more willing to take that risk so i think that's the first you know key uh, sort of message that i give out the second key message is 
your social skills to engage with large teams you know every company is fairly large there is the large you know team out there a lot of these people you know uh, come in and and take a lot of time to uh, you know get get uh, sociable with with the sales teams or the rest of the stakeholders with the head office folks they still manage but they look up to their bosses to manage difficult conversations or to drive a campaign or whatever i think the social skills make a tremendous amount of difference you know the faster you acquire them the faster you get uh, friendly with the sales team the better you you will uh, you know grow in your career so i think the social skills are super important the third one is the adaptability to the situation you know because uh you need to be prepared for uncertainty you need to be prepared for volatility and therefore adaptable uh, adaptability is not so much uh, 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 you know a good to have skill but almost a mandatory skill if you will uh, you know so those those are the three uh, things that that i would advise as skills to be picked up but you know the one thing that i always emphasize on and it's something that i practice personally is the work ethic you know um, some of them tend to sort of take it easy on one of the one or or two out of the three or four things that i'm going to call out uh you know these are the four cues that i've learned and and i've always sort of practiced them the iq eq pq and sq iq obviously stands for intelligence or intellectual quotient which is something that you're blessed with you can't do much about it maybe you can sort of refresh it a little bit hone it a little bit but i think the emotional quotient and the physical quotient uh those are absolutely in your control and i think those are two very important quotients to work on the last cue which is the spiritual quotient to something that we could talk about later on in life uh very important early on in all, also life but yeah i mean that could be excused a little bit uh, it may not be a mandatory requirement but eq and pq i don't see youngsters not all taking care of their physical quotient all that well just taking care of their health to just you know dressing up to the occasion to just making the right presentation coming fully prepared giving that right uh, amount of time for aesthetics of your presentation just goes a long way and often at times it's ignored and the emotional quotient super important uh, i see eq increasingly getting better in the younger generation they're far more calm or far more composed at least the ones that i worked with but i think those are the two important cues as well so fantastic i mean i really love the way you put it and summarize because you know we had answered my a lot of the last questions you know of, of today's discussion with you is what would be your messages closing messages you know to the marketers community you know in terms of not just the functional set skills but also the emotional skills etc which is i think you have so beautifully uh, summarized you know or just a while ago in terms of insights in terms of social and building your emotional skills and i think that's a very powerful message for our community sandeep uh, before we sign off i mean i i want to ask request you uh, in in your entire successful career of sales functionality uh, you know in terms of market access holding pnl roles you've seen the gamut right in this last two decades you've seen the industry morph itself from the late 90s to the early 2000s mid 2000s and now we're passing through an entirely new journey where it is more and more demanding for us and we have to continuously adapt ourselves as you had rightly said so my closing question to you is what are some of the new age skill sets or messages that you would want to pass on to our community that guys please be you know clear and conscious and what it takes to succeed because it's a very volatile world that you are currently living no one knows exactly so any closing thoughts on that sandeep i would i would request you to share with our audience yeah fair enough so i think this is you know you know largely marketing uh, you know group that yes. that's going to watch this uh, you know uh, message or or video and even um, business heads sandeep including sure. business heads and cluster heads yeah yeah sure so i think um the world is is going to be volatile uh it is going to be uncertain we've seen it in the last two years i don't think it's going away anywhere uh that's a norm resources are going to be increasingly constrained uh and and you will be asked to deliver uh with what you've been given uh and therefore you know that then puts us in a very difficult position or if you're smart uh, then you'll come out on the top and and my message is it's better to get smarter than than you know feeling like a victim because that's the norm 
and therefore uh, planning i think is supremely important uh, of 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 what your business looks like uh, we've discussed the core you know uh, uh, fundamentals of right from you know where are you going to sell that product and and why should they buy your product to what's your efficient and effective go to market model to what's your you know uh, resource planning in a constrained world uh is is something that you must must do uh and i've also spoken about the work ethic uh you know in in my last message which is supremely important because uh at every level you know there are there are peers but as you grow up the ladder the competition only gets stronger and and stiffer and therefore you need to keep beating your past best uh your yesterday's self in order to keep growing and therefore you cannot just you know take uh even a single day for granted uh but you know ask this question as to have you beaten yourself uh that you were yesterday so those are my closing remarks if if it made uh, any sense at all yes uh, it made no it made sense and i actually wanted to prompt you to also say, you know um how about reading skills sandeep the generation today doesn't read enough as what we used to probably read so i think that's also breed beyond what you actually do right so yeah and it's no, been, it's, yeah please go ahead yeah no i was just saying uh, you know learning and leadership has a direct correlation you know the more you learn the more you you know build your thoughts and therefore you build your ability to exert influence on more and more people so and it only comes from observing and reading and and you know, talking to people and and therefore you know therefore that the word insight is very powerful for me you know you you need to keep looking for those insights and whether it is a book or a conversation like this or or getting into uncomfortable situations uh every every situation or a book or a conversation gives you that one insight sometimes two great insights but as long as you're doing you know different things uh you're fine because you're you're learning and 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 but if you're doing the more of same uh then you're not learning and then there are no insights and that means you you don't you don't get the ability to influence and they point you really. yeah no that's that's very very powerful message uh, that you left the adult do the same thing repeatedly and try and master it but do different things and at least establish habit yeah.